Helikopter, helikopter. Това е време, което на TikTok и гледа TikTok по цял ден вместо да работи. Така, приятели, ще мина на английски, понеже имаме малко чужденци в аудиторията. So, nice to meet you guys. My name is Petr Jugansky. I am a HR and Recruitment Manager at Mobotak. I wouldn't take much of your time. This event is not here to promote our great company, which is my investment in software, but to promote more like a language. I can see many people from different companies. I know that some of you are already using Boeing as a main writing language. Some of us are not that much into it. In Goma, what we do, we're making a sports betting platform. I'd like to say that we are not doing with gambling. This is what our customers do. <laughs> but anyway, we have plenty of customers. Our platform is being used in uh, many countries and we're growing very rapidly. We are using plenty of uh, programming languages to develop our platform. And uh, one of the main of those languages is Boeing. Uh, Initially, our company is not uh, quite old. We just started like three years ago. Uh, we have a very strong Poland team in uh, Ukraine, but you know what's uh, happening there. And even before that, we decided to kick, kick off, kick start the uh, Poland uh, project in Bulgaria. Setan is our main Poland guy in Bulgaria. He's the technical lead for all of our Poland developers. And uh, you can see uh, his team that they do speak now. He will also speak a bit more about what exactly we do at uh, uh, open that. But yeah, our main idea is to promote uh, the languages, attract more people to, uh, to itself, and then it will be easier for us and in the end game to have more volume developers. Because uh, we believe our CTO, our architects, one of them is uh, here, they believe that the future of coding is in Golan. Not only in it, but <laughs> one of the main points. Uh, anyway, just before I give the word to uh, Zetsu, we prepared some merchandise for you. Uh, you can see notebooks uh, and other stuff. If you haven't taken one, you can do it after uh, we finish. Also, we've prepared some food, which after we finish with both of the lectures, we are welcome to enjoy. And also all the beers and all the soft drinks uh, are, are on us. Yeah, so that's all. Please welcome. He's setting the book. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, first of all, welcome to the first edition of our Boeing Meetup. This is an initiative that we plan to do again, if there is enough willingness and people are interested in it. A little bit about myself. Um, I am a technical lead at OpenTAC, uh, and together, uh, me and my team, we're building a product consisting of several Go microservices. And uh, we are great Go fanboys, which we really, uh, uh, call ourselves uh, the Gopher Army. So uh, today, uh, without any much further ado, I will present to you uh, one of the most hottest topics in the Go community. And to tell you the truth, this is a topic that if you asked me two years ago if I'm going to do a talk on it, I would definitely say I wouldn't believe that in my wildest dreams. Especially for the people uh, that have experience in Go and are part of the community, you probably know why. This was a, the most controversial feature in the language and there was a lot of polarizing opinions around it. But since February this year, with Go's 1.18 release, we finally got them. So today, I will present to you how generics in Go Games work. Uh, a little bit about the agenda. First, we'll describe exactly what are generics in a general fashion. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what are type parameters and how are they um, basically utilized in the language. We'll also explain what type constraints mean in Golang context. Uh, something very interesting called type approximation. And at the end, we'll finish with uh, some best practices uh, to give some guidance how uh, generics could be uh, utilized uh, at best because even though they're a very powerful feature, there are a lot of places where it's not a good idea to use them. So at the end, we'll finish with that. So let's start. <clears throat> First, what are generics? Well, um, usually, generics are a mechanism that basically 
avoid writing boilerplate code. What that means is when we write data structures and functions, we also specify the types. So we write basically our blueprint of our uh, program and our data structures and we basically instantiate them uh, using types. And this is very important for me uh, using the word instantiate because uh, let's say when we call, uh, when we say we call a method, that happens at runtime. But because when we instantiate generic code, it happens at compile time. Um, so yeah, generic functions have type parameters, which we'll uh, get into more details. Uh, and where you can use type parameters in Go, in, in the specific built-in Go types, and also user-defined struct types. Uh, so let's start with the most basic example before we even have generics in the language. This is an example of a non-generic function. Here we have a slice of hints and we want to reverse the order. Nothing too complicated as, as you can see. We specify uh, uh, the slice as a slice of hints and we want to return a slice of hints. So how could we turn this piece of code into uh, generic with type parameters? So basically this is the new syntax that's introduced in the latest re release and I will get into a bit more details here. As you can see, uh, after the function name, we have angle brackets, which is uh, where, we where we specify our type parameter t. Uh, but this could be any letter, any word, whatever. It, it doesn't have any limitations regarding that. And this, uh, uh, keyword actually, any, this is a built-in type constraint. We'll get into a bit more details about exactly what type constraints are. But the any type constraint basically uh, allows us to input all types without any restrictions. So uh, we'll get into more details about that. Also, as you can see, now our uh, variable parameter s is now not an in slice, it's a slice of t. And basically the same as a return result. So how can we call a generic function? Uh, there are two ways to do it. First way is without type arguments. And why does this work? Because um, we, we initialize, uh, we, we input uh, the, the method parameters as an int slice. And basically the compiler infers that basically we instantiate it with, with the int, uh, int type argument. But also, we can basically do it explicitly uh, with specifying that we want to instantiate with an int type argument. Uh, there, there are use cases for both, uh, because there are some situations when you write code where the compiler cannot infer. So that's the places where we use providing the type argument, and when the compiler is smart enough to infer it, we can omit it. Uh, so, finally, let's talk about type parameters. Type parameters can be used several places. Uh, first, uh, we start with functions. I already showed you the example with reversing a slice. Here we have an even more simple example, which is a print function that has the signature of accepting a, a generic argument of t with an any constraint, and then we just print it. Something more interesting here, which we will not dig too deep here, because it's out of the scope of this talk, is how the compiler actually uh, interprets this code and what it builds. It, it could either do uh, one of two things, either build separate definitions for each combination of type pass, or uh, it could run interface-based definitions based on usage patterns, but this gets a little bit into the escape analysis case of the compiler, so that's why we don't want to um, go too much into it. As you know, uh, as probably some of you have written in C++, generics, their work, uh, they generate new binaries for each type that's instantiated in your programs. And this is not very optimal because it, it makes the compile time slow and also has excessive binaries, your binary blocks. So Go does way smarter things than this, but again, as I mentioned, if there's interest, we can do a talk especially for that, but this is out of the scope of today's talk. So well, now we start with the built-in types in Go, uh, where we can utilize generics. Uh, here, for example, we use it for uh, slices. Um, I have an example here uh, of a function that accepts a slice and also has a callback function that also uses generic type 
parameter uh, to, to get the type of the item and we want to do some processing on that uh, slice. So I'll show you a quick example right now. Uh, just tell me if you can. The people in the back, can you see? Everything? Okay, great. So uh, again, we have the same function, but I gave an example here that uh, the processing we want to do on each element of the slice is just printing it. Uh, so when we uh, build that function, uh, when we define that function, we basically input the same signature. We want to define the type parameter, the type constraint, and the same uh, signature, which basically fits the parameter and the for each function. Uh, so in my uh, main function, what I do as examples, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I don't input here um, the, the instantiated type because it is inferred from the int slice. But for the print function, uh, the compiler cannot infer. So let, let me show you very quickly. When I run this code, uh, yeah, everything works. But if I decide to commit uh, the type argument, sorry, uh, yep, yeah, I get this error that I cannot use generic function print without instantiation. Basically, the compiler cannot know if the t from the for each function match the t of the print function. So that's why we need to explicitly specify. Uh, okay. So, on to maps. Uh, maps have a little bit of a detail I need to mention here. Uh, we have two different types that we use as uh, generics. We will have a type for the key and we have a type for the value. Usually, um, the value doesn't have any restrictions, that's why we apply the any built-in constraint. But for keys, we, we uh, as you all know from data structures and how maps work, all keys have to be comparable because why is that needed? When you have collisions, um, with your hashes uh, for the keys, you usually overflow them in buckets and linked lists. And because you need to compare uh, the values in those lists, uh, so you need your keys to, to be able to be either equal or not equal. So that's why they need to be comparable. The compiler actually will not allow you to put any for, for the key uh, type parameter. And I should also mention that comparable is a built-in constraint. So it is available in the language. Uh, yeah, again, an example here. Uh, I have a map of int keys and int values, and a map of string keys and int values. And as you can see, again, I don't specify uh, the type parameters, and when I run it, it works, basically. So we have a generic function. OK, on to structs. Structs uh, also have a uh, site specific that we need to mention here. This, is, this basically applies to how to use generics and methods in structs, because you cannot uh, uh, use type parameters in methods, but you can use type parameters in fields of structs. Uh, the way you utilize those uh, type parameters is that you have access to them from the struct. So I, I, let's say I have, a, uh, I have defined on my struct an item from type t, t again is a any constraint, and uh, when I implement my get method, I have to use uh, that field from the struct. I cannot input in the signatures in the signature uh, any generic parameters. Uh, yeah, so I think I'll skip here the demo. Okay, so uh, another uh, huge place where we can utilize generics is so-called generic types. Basically, uh, those are custom types that we, we can nest in, in our uh, programs. Basically, we can define a struct uh, and use it in a function which is passed by a parameter. And here I have an example of what I actually mean. I have the, the struct pair. It has a key and a value. Uh, and they're both from any constraint. And I have a pairs function. This is a function, not a method. It's not attached to a pair struct. 
uh, where I again declare the, my two generic type parameters. Uh, and what this function actually does, I pass in a map and I get a slice of errors. I just convert it. Um, so uh, I'll show you this one fairly quickly. Uh, again, because we, uh, sorry, yeah, because uh, k is also a type parameter of the map, this is again mandatory for it to be comparable. This is very, very simple code. Basically, we, we uh, loop over the map and we instantiate new pairs, and those pairs get appended to a slice, which is of the type uh, pair, key, and value, again, the generic types. So in my examples here, I have a map from string to string, and I can basically loop it and print keys and values. And as you can see, this works. If I input a map from int to int, for example, it will also work without any issues. Okay, okay let's move on to uh, a feature that's uh, very specific to Golang, which are type constraints. Uh, we already mentioned some of them, especially the built ones. Now I will show you exactly how to do custom type constraints. So what are type constraints in general? Um, they basically allow you uh, to perform specific operations. The constraint basically is the contract. Actually, contract is a very interesting word here because this was one of the proposals when generics uh, were specified for the language to, uh, to have contracts, which, uh, which contracts are basically what constraints are today. So they specify exactly what each type has to, um, uh, has to support in order to, to use it in your code. Um, uh, and basically the compiler uses that to, to, to perform the check. Uh, and now I will explain exactly what types of constraints there are. The most simple one are constraints with methods. And as you can see here, there's nothing too special. It, it's just regular Go interfaces. But the interfaces themselves, they are constraints. The only difference here is that what we impose upon uh, when calling, um, uh, let's say, a function that implements this interface is that that type can only perform operations defined on that. Because as you can see in stringer function, this is not a method, we, we say the constraint is stringer. And this usually says that we have to, this will allow us to call the string method. It has to have a string method implemented. Um, okay, so on to the more interesting parts. So this is something new in the language that hasn't been available till now. And that is constraints with predefined types. As you can see, we use uh, the interface syntax. But what we do here, it kind of looks a little bit like uh, type embedding in Golang. But as you can see, we embed actually uh, uh, built-in types in the language, like integer. And those types are called predefined types. Uh, and they, um, they are the ones that basically implement the interfaces that are used in the constraints. Here is a more advanced example. Let's say we want to constrain our type parameters to only receive arguments that are only numeric. That includes all integer types and all float types. The way we do it, this is another new syntax introduced in the language using the pipe operator called union operator, which basically allows us to do uh, union types. Union types are also something you've probably heard in some other languages although probably a bit more exotic languages. Uh, so what we want to achieve here is that we gather, we say, uh, I have an interface called number, and I want my arguments to be either one of those types. That's it. So uh, now I have here a function that uses that constraint that I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, and what this constraint allows me is that because uh, this constraint is only allows numeric values, numbers usually support arithmetic operations. So that, that's why I can, I can do x is greater than y. Now I'll show you the example right now. 
pretty simple one. I have my uh, I have my uh, constraint defined defined number. I use that constraint in my uh, max function, and what I do is I I call it with integer numbers. I call it with float numbers. So when I run it, it compiles and returns the bigger number. But something very specific, I will try to call it with strings. If I call it with strings, it says string does not implement number because string is not part of that uh, union that basically the constraint imposes upon us because we cannot mention string in the number constraint. Okay, let's continue. This is something uh, very interesting, uh, which actually when I did my talk, I thought that already this was part of the standard library. There is a package called constraints, uh, which basically defines, uh, it has predefined constraints that you can use in your, in your call. So we don't need to specify, let's say, a number of constraints. This is basically the equivalent that comes from the uh, standard library, which is order. Uh, I will show you now a demo. Uh, order basically defines uh, supporting a greater than, less than, equals, and not equals operators. Uh, but something very interesting to show you, uh, I'll zoom in a bit. Constraints is part of Golang X. Those are basically, for people that have experience with Golang, usually before a package gets promoted, uh, as a standard one, it becomes first part of the experimental suite of packages. So probably the creator decided, uh, this, as far as I followed some of the threads in GitHub, they included constraints as standard package and then they reverted it and put it back into the experimental packages. So in version 118, the current version, uh, built-in or predefined constraints are experimental, so you can use them at your own will, but I think they serve a good purpose even now. Probably in the next version, this will get promoted as a standard package and it will be only called constraints, for example. So, uh, as you see, we have absolutely the same function. The only difference here is that we have not defined any constraint and we, uh, we just use the, the one that is provided by this package. Okay, move on. Uh, something even more interesting, which is called type approximation. And I will explain right now what this means. Uh, as you can see, the syntax starts to get creepier and creepier. Uh, we've introduced uh, built-in types and interfaces, we introduced the union operator, now we introduce another operator, which is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the tilde operator. I'm not good at Greek, so excuse me. Uh, which what, what it allows us basically is to define uh, custom types uh, which uh, their under, underlying type is one of the types that we mentioned here. A quick example, we have a type point that basically its underlying type is int. So when I use the tilde symbol, basically I say that allow, uh, this constraint should allow type arguments that uh, their underlying type is an integer, but it could be anything that I basically decide it could be called when I use the type keyword. This will not work for regular structs because there we have fields and the compiler doesn't know exactly which type of those fields should be the correct underlying type. So this only works when we do type aliases, basically. Um, and again, I'll show you the demo. Uh, sorry. Uh, again, I have the same number interface, but uh, I put the tilde symbol in front of each of the types. I have a type point defined uh, with an underlying type integer, and I have, again have the same max function. But this time, instead of just specifying integers, I specify points. I say points uh, with a value of 5 and point with a value of 2. And when I run the max function, again, it works and says that 5 is the bigger number. Okay? So far, so good. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, this is something important to mention here that using interfaces is not mandatory. Uh, we can do inline constraints. So basically, all the syntax that you saw in the number interface, I could inline it directly 
were in signature of a function. So let's say in this max function, I say that my t type parameter should be uh, integer or float 32 or float 64. And also those types can be underlying types or custom types that I define. Well, that was a mouthful. Uh, again, uh, again, absolutely the same demo I will show you. Uh, I have a custom type called int point and type float point. And the underlying type here is int and the float point is float 64. I do my inline constraint and basically in my first example, I instantiate two in points and then instantiate two flow points. And when I run this, as you can see, it works. Uh, okay. Something even more helpful, we can use those constraints and nest them because that will make it also a bit more clearer in the code. Uh, for example, I can specify multiple interfaces and then use them together, combine them together. I have an integer constraint that basically only defines all integers predefined types. I have a float constraint that, cons that uh, uh, declares all floating point types. Uh, and I have a number constraint that does a union between both of them. So this is uh, a bit more uh, clear. And this is also something as a best practice to also use in your code. Try to, um, to make your constraints as small as possible and just simply compose them. That's it. Uh, okay. Absolutely the same example. Yeah. Cool. Okay, on to the, more, on to the best part. <laughs> when to use the generics and when it is a sin to use them. Uh, most important principle, the gopher said, write code, don't design types. M the most important thing is, you need to write your code, you need to write your business logic, you need to make it work correct. If that even in includes just working with a single type, that's okay. When you finally know exactly how everything works, then you start to think about how can I make it generic if I need to make it generic. And now we'll uh, explain a bit more exactly in which situations you should consider even using generics. But again, this is the most important one as a recommendation. So, only. Okay, good use cases. Functions that work with sizes, maps, and channels. Uh, one of the demos that I haven't prepared today. Channels is also one of the built-in types that you can use with generics and probably this is one of its most useful um, um, its most useful uses um, <clears throat> because you can you can uh, write let's say uh, complex concurrency patterns which you will learn more about in Nikki's talk and you can make them generic because you can make them work with channels from integer, string, or custom types, whatever. Um, we've talked about maps and slices. General purpose data structures. We already uh, also showed this example. For example, if you want to build a linked list, you want to build a binary tree, you want to build a pair, you want to build whatever. Everything that we use is a data structure and we basically nest and use and intertwine in other parts of the code. Um, very important when a method is the same for all types. Uh, this is uh, related basically for when, let's say, you have some methods defined for arithmetic operations. And usually those methods are the same both for integers and for floating point uh, numbers. Uh, so in this case, it's actually mandatory to use generics but you just use it with a number constraint. You say, I can use only numeric types, but which of those numeric types, I don't care. And all my logic will be the same. It doesn't matter if I use an integer or a float. Um, bad use case. When just calling a method on a type argument. I think the answer is pretty easy here. Can somebody say what, what should we use in this case? Because when we, when we have uh, a custom type and we just want to call a method on it and want to generalize it. 
silence. What did, what did you say? Okay, but uh, yeah, of course you need to define a method, but I want to make it generic. How can I make exact interfaces? Yeah, so in this case, we just use interfaces. When a method implementation is different for each type, when it's different, we just write tests. <laughs> and very interesting here, when the operation is different even without a method. A very good example here is the encoding JSON package. As you know, all of you probably have used JSON struct tags to serialize serialized data. Um, why? Why basically? Do you know? Okay, again, a question. What would you do in this case? Because you can expect all different types of data structures and JSON structures. Basically, you can have only. You can have JSON arrays, you can have different objects. So what would be what would be the mechanism used here to generalize for all types of JSON? No. And you know why? Because if you want to implement an interface, you have to you have to have a Marshall JSON method for each of the types. And for example, uh, primitive types that cannot implement. Yay. <laughs> okay, time's up. Uh, <clears throat> the answer here is reflection. Uh, reflection is also a type of genetic programming. It's a very popular programming model. It's usually not recommended in most cases, but here it's the perfect case for it. Because, as I mentioned, you cannot impose, let's say, implementation of Marshall JSON method on predefined primitive types, basically. So, also, you have different kinds of structures. So you cannot be sure that you've covered all cases at all. And yeah, so let's do a summary of what we've talked today. We've defined exactly what are generics, what we use them for. We also introduced how uh, Go implements type parameters and also what are type constraints and uh, what do they impose upon the type parameters. And we also gave advice on how we went to use generics in favor of interfaces and reflection. Because generics, interfaces, and reflections are all types of generic programming. But you need to know exactly when to use each of them. Woo! Okay. <laughs> Awkward silence while the golfers are staring at us. <laughs> and questions. Thank you. So the analogy of a generic of a type constraint for interface is the any type constraint, basically. Because interface does not impose any restrictions on your, on your types. It's the same as using any. So we can use any interface as an argument to any type constraint? Yeah, yeah, you can. I didn't hear. Are there any performance penalties when using Very good question, 10 points. Uh, so, uh, because I don't know exactly the details of how the runtime does it, as far as I've read, uh, I think the creators did a very good job. They say that the performance is analogous with calling interfaces. So, usually, a rule of thumb, this is probably something important that I forgot to mention in the best practices. Don't use generics or use generics in favor to when you plan for uh, performance optimizations or efficiency. Use them if they make your call clearer, because uh, it's it's not utilized that way. In C plus plus, for example, when a lot of companies that, that use it, uh, usually all C plus plus teams have this convention: we will use only this subset of the features of the language because. We skip virtual methods, templates, whatever, all the bullshit that they introduce in each new version. 
because it has a huge performance penalty there. But in Golang, first we don't uh, usually we don't use it as a system language, although some people claim that it is in system language. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to write clean and maintainable code, and we want to optimize performance in different ways, not by excluding features of the language. Maybe uh, there is uh, one, one else thing uh, you can use genetics for, because uh, most cases, for example, in Kubernetes, they have developed uh, code generation tools. In some cases, you can use now genetics to avoid uh, writing uh, code generation tools. Or maybe if it's uh, if there is penalty performance penalty in this case, you can still use code generation, but uh, yeah, you have to make uh, of course some evaluations in this. Yeah, this is this is a very good note because uh, as I mentioned, the, the the biggest controversy in the language was the lack of generics in Go, and uh, to one of the mechanisms to mitigate that lack was basically to put huge emphasis on code generation. This will not change, of course, but when we now have generics, we can basically skip most of the use cases we use code generators for because we don't need. To. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Thank you again. Uh, and I will pass on to Nikki. Thank you guys. Concurrency may not 
or may allow for parallel execution and also uh, allows you to uh, com the composition of independent tasks. What does this mean? Take, for example, uh, you have to calculate Fibonacci numbers and prime numbers. You can uh, calculate, uh, for example, end Fibonacci number and uh, also prime number, but not at the same time, but you can like exchange the processes, do one thing, do the other thing. And this is very useful, as you'll see later. So what uh, Golan gives us as a comparison abilities is the Goldings, which I uh, will talk a little bit later in the next slides, is the channels, uh, select statements, mutexes, weight groups, and so on. We have also atomic operations, we have uh, conditions, and more. So Goldings, what are the Goldings? The Goldings are uh, like lightweight light threads, so they are not always threads, but they are uh, something like them. <laughs> they are managed by the golden time. For example, even the OS thread takes about 2 megabytes of, uh, of the memory. A royalty takes about 2 kilobytes. So it's much, much smaller. And it allows us to run many, many more royalties in a single process. They are, of course, managed by the golden time, uh, but we will not cover this in, in this talk. The, me the memory access should be synchronized. So if you have uh, one variable that uh, needs to be accessed by uh, two more teams or more, you have to synchronize this using one of the primitives that uh, Go language gives us to do so. And we have here, uh, does everybody see a code here, or should I open it? In the back? Okay. Uh, so we have here a simple example where you can run a core team, and as probably many of you will, uh, will see, this actually will not execute. If you open this and we run it, you see that actually the program existed without printing anything. And we will we'll see in the next slides how we can fix this. But you can uh, easily run a routine by using the keyword go and then a function. It's, uh, this is actually an inline function, but you can also use it with a predefined function outside. Okay, let's continue. Yeah, something very important uh, for a world teams, and we'll cover this also later, you should always have an exit branch for the world team. This is in case uh, yeah, you don't want to have some leaks in your application. So, the next thing we are going to talk about is channels. Uh, this text here is a very popular, uh, very popular saying in the Go community which is not communicate by sharing memory, instead, instead share memory by communicating. What does this imply is that you shouldn't use the same, uh, the same var variable if you want to communicate between more things, but you should rather use channels which you send information and the other more thing will read from this channel. So channels, they are the most primitive uh, the most simple primitive in the language to uh, make synchronization. It allows for communication between routines, as we said earlier. So you can have one, word, one channel which you can write or read from, and the routines can communicate this way. It's bidirectional, yes. you can read and write. And there are also buffered and unbuffered channels. So we'll see a bit later what uh, these are. So syntax about channels, how do you, do you use them? You have the, uh, this is how you define a channel. Then on the third line, show you okay. On the third line, you have writing on a channel. This actually, you have the strut is the type of the channel, and you just send an empty strut here. Writing uh, to a channel actually blocks if it's not buffered. In this case, uh, this channel is unbuffered, so the writing will block until we have somebody reading from it. So on my five we have reading from the channel, and of course also the reading from the channel will also block if nobody is reading from it. Then we have uh, defined a buffer channel which has, which has five, uh, five buffer, which means you can write up until five times to this channel without blocking, and if you want to 
to try to write a sixth time without anybody reading, you will also block, it will block until somebody reads from this channel and you can again write up until you reach the end of this book. Yeah. And also reading, of course, will also block if there are no data in the channel. So how can we, so how can we make the program from before to, uh, to execute the, the print statement? Oh, that, yeah. So what we have here is we have our channel that we can use to wait, to make the main goroutine wait before uh, the goroutine that we start here inside the main function is executed. What, are, what does the function mean? that we start doing? It just prints something, then sleeps, then uh, writes to this channel. If we start this program now, should hopefully print something. <coughs> and uh, in this case, this is our uh, this is our like uh, completion of the goroutine. We, we have an exit branch of this goroutine, and we are signaling that we have done our work. So so uh, the other goroutine, which is the main goroutine, it knows that there is something yet to be finished, and it waits waits on this line to read from the channel, and until this uh, this goroutine writes to the channel, it will not exit. Okay. Next, we have the select statements. Select statements, uh, you can imagine it like uh, switch statements in uh, other languages, but it allows us to wait on channels. What does this mean? Is that we can say, uh, we are trying to select from uh, several channels. For example, if there is something to be read, read from one channel, we can wait on this, or we can or we can wait on another channel also to read from. Uh, the example that we have here, we have the, the, this case that is reading from the down channel. If there is something written in this channel, it will go through this branch. If, but if there is something to be written in result channel, it will go through this. If neither of these cases are uh, can be done, it will go through the default, through the default case. Uh, but actually, you don't need, uh, it's not, uh, in, I forgot the word, sorry. Uh, it's not need to default, to type the default case, uh, like in switch statements, of course. And if we check the example, actually, this example, because uh, nobody is writing to the down channel and nobody is reading from the result channel, this problem will just, will just exit because we get the default, default case. Just paste it. And uh, that's it for the select statement. So you can wait for multiple channels to read or write to, or have another default case which just proceeds. How can we use the, uh, the select statements to signal a routine to uh, finish early? In this case, let me open. Yeah. So here we have a routine that has a, an infinite loop, and it waits uh, on the select statement, it waits on this elapsed channel. The elapsed channel, it will just, uh, this is a, a pre, sorry. Time after is just a predefined uh, type in the, in the startup library, which gives us, uh, gives us a channel which will be closed after this amount of time. So after four seconds, the elapsed will be closed, and it and this select statement will be executed. So our routine will write to this down channel, which is as we saw in the previous example, the down channel is the one that the main routine is waiting on. And in this case here, we are using elapsed to to tell the routine to stop executing itself. And let's. Let's see. So it starts printing uh, with sleeping for one seconds after each print, 
and when the four seconds elapses, it will close the, uh, the voting that it has started because of this select statement. It just returns and also writes, before that, it writes to the down channel to signal the main routine that it can stop. So that's why you can uh, use select statements to signal the goroutines to stop. So some, some things that are very important is uh, the completion of the goroutines. It, can, it has several uh, types of exits. When it has completed its work, for example, if you, if you are scraping uh, a website, if you have a, an array of URLs that you want to scrape, it can just do its work, iterate over the array, and just stop. The other way is, uh, for example, if you encounter a non-recoverable error, for example, a network error, the, the, the go team don't, don't need to proceed with the others, it can just uh, say exit. And the other, the other way is when it's stopped to stop working. So the example with the elapsed channel can be something more complicated. For example, another go team may have uh, created a channel that tells the, the started routine to stop. We'll see an example of this later. So something very important in uh, using channels, uh, because in bigger projects you might mess up uh, using the channels, it, it's the channel ownership. The ownership of the channel is to the one who created it. So the one who created this is responsible to write to it and to close it. And the one who consumes from the channel should only um, read from this channel and take care of, uh, of the life cycle and not blocking on the channel. And let's see an example of this. In this case, you have uh, one function which is the owner function. This function uh, returns a channel which you can only read from. Um, and it starts a goroutine which ends after two seconds and right to the down channel. And the owner returns this channel. But as you can see, because of this, you, you say that uh, the channel that is returned by the owner can only be read right from. So the consumer will receive a channel that it can read from and try to read from it. And then we, we just execute. It should be. Yeah? Forgot to adjust the example. Yeah. Please stop. Just talk, talk to stop. It's pretty, pretty, pretty simple example. The things that I said earlier, again, the channel owner is responsible for instantiating the channel, it's responsible to writing, or it can pass the ownership to another go team, meaning that one go team can create a channel and, and give it to another go team, but there should be only one go team that is responsible to writing. You shouldn't uh, write code that writes to you shouldn't write go team, two go teams that write to the same channel because you might end up in, with uh, some race conditions. The owner should also be responsible for closing the channel and also encapsulate the previous three things uh, with the reading channel. So the owner returns a channel that can only be read from. That's what uh, point four emphasizes. The channel consumer it has much more, much less work to do, knowing when the channel is closed. So, uh, if the channel is closed, it, it doesn't uh, have to read anymore from it. And the responsibility handling blocking. So, handling blocking, you can imagine it as uh, having a select statement and trying to read from the channel, or uh, the default case, which it can do something else. Or, for example, try to read from another channel. This is what can be blocking this. Next thing, weight groups. Weight groups, pretty simple. You have uh, this sync package, which is a part of the standard library. Uh, 
with the add method to the weight group, you can add, you can uh, say that you are adding one amount of work. With the down method, you signal that you have finished one amount of work. And with weight, uh, you are telling to wait, uh, for the work team to wait until the counter is zero. So down uh, adds minus one, for example. What is important here is that add should be executed before you start the board team, because otherwise the board team may, because wait might happen before you add. If you if I put the add in the board team, this wait will most probably happen before we add and will just continue. So add should be executed before the board team started. And the time should be in the board team. So, we have here a Gorotin leak. Where exactly is the Gorotin leak? We have a function uh, which uh, accepts a channel and returns a channel. Inside this function, we are we starting a Gorotin that uh, simply reads uh, from this channel until it's closed. This syntax with the range, you just iterate through a channel until it's closed. So, how do we execute this? We just say do work with new. What will this do? Actually, reading from the new channel will block forever because it will wait for something to be uh, to be passed, but to be passed on the new channel. But you cannot pass anything to the new channel, so we have uh, a leak here, a leaking working. And imagine this in a bigger application where you have. Uh, thousands of thousands of uh, boroutines that, that are started on, a, for example, on an HTTP request and they just hang up. How do we fix uh, this boroutine leak? I'm not sure because I doubt it that everyone can see. I open it in the playground. We get the same uh, do work function, which as we said earlier about Gorotins, which there should be a way to, to tell the Gorotin when it should stop. Normally, this is either done by providing a down channel to the Gorotin, which in this case is this down channel as the first argument, or as may, many of you know, we have contexts. Uh, here, I decided to talk with uh, channels because it's more interesting. You can achieve the same thing with uh, context, of course. So uh, the do work is started. Uh, yeah, it started here. We have provided it the down channel, and the uh, the channel that the board team will read from is again new. But what we have here is in the main board team we are starting another board team which. After one second, it will close the down channel that is provided to the complete to the do work uh, function. And closing the down channel will actually signal the board the, the board team that is down here to stop. And how do we wait for this down? We have here a select statement which tries to read from the strings channel, and if it cannot read from it, but it can read from the down channel, it will read, of course, from the down channel and just return. And this is the exit branch of this working. If we start this example, we'll see that we have tested the dual working and the door is. As you can see, here is the work is. So we have we have our confirmation that the working has stopped. And we don't leak at the working. Moving on, uh, this is something that is very important also. If, a, if we have one goal team that creates another goal team, you can imagine like a child process, child goal team. Uh, the first one, the parent goal team, should be responsible for uh, telling the child to stop at some point. Or, so you, can, you should have either uh, providing the context for every function down the line that you execute, or you should have a channel, a channel that goes down the line to every function that is executed and that can potentially start 
of other routing. And hopefully, uh, the first down channel is created in the main routing. So if your program stops, it will signal the other routings to finish their work, of course. Maybe mo most of you know it as using the context for this uh, purpose. So now we go to the uh, interesting part, useful channel functions. And we're going to start with the OR channel. Uh, the OR channel pattern allows us to wait on uh, any number of channels at the same time while providing a, a one channel as an output. So we provide that normally. Yeah. So we provide many channels to the OR function and just returns one channel. And what this allows us, allows us to wait only on one, only on one channel, and when any of this channel is closed, we'll have the result. So this allows us to wait for on multiple on multiple exit branches, let's say. So we have here two channels, down one and down two. We have two more things, one of them is writing to the down one. And one of them is writing to down two. One of them is sleeping two seconds, the other for four. And let's and we have in the end reading from the result of all of down two and down one. And whichever exits first, we'll just uh, know. We won't know which one of them exited, but we'll have uh, we have we will have waited for at least one of them. For example, if you are doing several HTTP requests to different uh, endpoints, and you, and you care for only one of the results of these endpoints, you can use this pattern to wait for it. Yeah. We see here working down one. And this one is the one that slept for two seconds. We, we haven't, uh, this one didn't even have the, the time to finish execution. So how, how is this implemented? <clears throat> we have a simple, the simple case when you don't have any, any channels in the array, it just returns the new channel. As we saw earlier, this will, this will actually uh, block reading from it, but we'll see how, how this is uh, not a problem. Then we have the case with one channel, we just return this simple channel. And this is the bottom of the, the, the recursion. Next, we are creating uh, a, a support channel, which we'll see how, how we use. And then we start the routing. The case with the, if we have only two channels, we can just use a simple select statement and wait on either, either of them. And then if one of them is closed, it will go through the case and it will, and it will then uh, finish the routing and close this all the all down channel, which is to return as a <laughs> as a return of the function or. If we have if we have more than two channels that we have to wait for, we are waiting for the first three, then we're calling the or with <laughs> everything left from this channel. So here is the new channel. If we have three channels, this will be new because we have. Uh, what is left from this, this will be new. And then we provide the all down, because this way we are ensuring that we have at least two channels, and the all down is closed actually here. So we provide the all down down the line, and if it's closed, it will exit, uh, and we will not, we not, we not block on this reading from the new channel. Okay, that was, uh, I know it's quite a lot of information. I don't uh, think that any of you will remember this, so we'll, we'll send also the uh, presentation after the meeting. Okay, next on the line we have repeat and take. Okay, first we're going to start with the repeat. What does repeat uh, gives us? Repeat allows us to uh, have like an infinite, infinite array of values, infinite list, 
you can define uh, what types do you want as a uh, as a list of items, and you can and you provide also the down channel, which is again to used to to tell the board team to stop generating uh, any more values. And then we create the channel that we provide the values on, and we just start the board team that provides uh, the value types that you have told it to provide. It will write them to the uh, to the returned channel. And if it's told to stop, it will just stop. The other thing that we have is take. Take allows us to say we want to take uh, a certain amount of values from a channel. How can we use this? We have created something like a pipeline here. So we have first, say, we say, take with the down channel. Uh, further, further down the line, we'll use down as a channel to, to, to tell the boroteens to stop. So we use it uh, everywhere we have uh, starting boroteens. So we say, take, and then repeat one. So the repeat will repeat one, 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 one. And we'll take 10, 10 times from the channel that repeat have, has returned. If we start this, you see that we have 10 times 1. If we say, we can say here even whatever we like, we can say here A. And as the value is a uh, varag, we can say A and B. And we will take A, B, A, B, A, B up until we have taken 10 values. So we have 5 times A and 5 times B. And you can change this however you like. Okay. <clears throat> up until now, uh, we just saw some concurrency patterns, but we haven't touched even how do we uh, how do we make it parallel? How do we execute things in parallel? Uh, there should be several conditions that uh, we should meet before we can do things in parallel. Uh, the work that we, the things that we calculate should not depend on each other. So if you want to calculate the Fibonacci numbers, of course you can do it because you depend on the previous values. So the first thing is do not depend on the previous values. Second thing is having a long running task. Because if it's just a simple task, you don't need to use concurrency for this. Not concurrency, but parallelism. Uh, and you can just uh, execute it in, in the current routine. How to run more routines? Uh, here in this example, we are just running uh, the C number of CPUs routines as a workers. And we are also creating, uh, on the second line, we are creating an array. This is an array of channels, which is the number of workers. So if we have uh, four workers, we'll have four channels in this array. And each worker will actually write its result to the workers, to this uh, array of channels. So now what do we have? Uh, more than one channel. What do we do? How do we consume from them? We want to somehow consume from all of these qualities that are generating some results. We use the combine, or maybe some of you know it as uh, fade in, fade out. I have, I have defined it as combine. Combine actually allows us to provide several channels of certain type, and we return the same type, type but only one channel, which you can read from. We need to actually read from whichever channel has any data inside. How fast do it? We use uh, wait groups to wait for all of this work to be done. How much work do we have? We have number of the channels work. So if we have four workers, we we'll have four channels, we have four amount of work. So we add uh, four. Then we iterate over each channel that we have, and we start the goal team for each channel. We have uh, wait group down to signal that we have finished one work. And then we just 
iterate over the channel of that goal team. And we're writing the, the data from the, uh, from the current goal team's channel to a result channel, which is only one. Here we have it. It's the, this is the same channel from, uh, from each goal team. Now, next we have uh, another goal team that waits uh, waits for the weight group to finish. So if we have uh, finished the weight group, it means that uh, the workers have finished their work. And then we can uh, safely close the result channel. Okay. In the main goal team, now how do we use this? We have started uh, here, we're starting the board teams, the workers. Then we, then we say combine all the channels from the workers' result and just iterate over a simple channel. And this thing becomes only one channel, and it's simple to read, it's easily understandable. It, it will be very cumbersome to, to see select statements that for select statements that wait for all the workers to, to uh, finish their work. And the work is actually pretty simple. We are just writing once, once to a channel after sleeping for one second. If we execute this, you see we have eight workers. Each one of them is writing once. And each one of them is uh, saying uh, this string when it has finished its work. And in the end, problem exits. And this is a fan in, fan out pattern. We are first starting more things, and then we are combining the results together. You can also do something uh, interesting here with the result. For example, if you have to further process the result, you can start processing the result in another world things, not only, not in, only in the main world team. But in this case, we are only creating the results, so we are not doing anything special with it. Uh, an important uh, <laughs> message here, don't be afraid to start world things, as they are very cheap in the whole language. You can even start millions, millions of world things, uh, not like in, uh, in languages that, yeah, uh, in languages that you can use threads, the all threads are much more uh, memory intensive. But be afraid of not completing them, because if you have leaking properties, you also leak memory, which is not good. You can use tools like uh, PPROF to see the, how your program is executing and if it's leaking any properties so when it finishes. So, a few real world uh, examples. Limit your workers, because uh, I, I, had a, I had a real world issue one time when, when we were starting just uh, working upon HTTP requests and we were, make, we were making another HTTP request to a downstream server and we end up killing the downstream server because we didn't limit the amount of workers that we were using. So it's very important to limit your workers, but also uh, do it in a fashion that you can configure it not by changing the code, but just changing the configuration. Because you might need more workers uh, at some point. Watch your queues. In our example, we didn't uh, touch anything about uh, buffered channels, but you can also buffer your channels. But if you buffer your channels, you might uh, not increase your throughput, because if you cannot uh, process the data in the queues, you might again limit the throughput of your program. So uh, you have to first evaluate what uh, size of the queue you need before you can say I need I need to make it buffer. Timeouts. You have timeouts in your request. It's very important because otherwise uh, you will just limit uh, not only but uh, you will fill your queues very, very quickly if you wait for a request that will never finish. So you have to have uh, reasonable timeouts. 
And of course, this can lead to cascading failures. Uh, and you can either kill your uh, downstream services or much worse things may happen. So now we are on the questions section. You can use uh, PPROF, or you can also watch the memory of your application if it grows over time. Of course, uh, you're restarting. If you're running Kubernetes or some other platform, it will restart your uh, process if something happens or if you redeploy. But you can still like watch uh, the memory of your application and have uh, if it's if it only goes up and up and the garbage collection that does not. Uh, in everything, you will see that it goes up and up uh, with time.